All right, I guess we'll get started. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. My name's uh, Steve Hoffman. I work at Orbitz. Um, we're going to talk about hybrid workflows and Docker and Mesos. Um, Orbitz, travel website. Uh, you know, it's surprising. Uh, some people still haven't heard of us. We've been around 15, 16 years now. Uh, but anyway, quick uh, show of hands. Who used Orbitz to get here? Awesome. Thanks for being a customer. For those of you who haven't heard of us, uh, we are a travel website. We have multiple brands, both websites and web services. So for instance, if you search Kayak, they search us through our web services, things like that. Lots of backends, uh, different partners we connect to. Um, our platform is basically composed of uh, several hundred, hundreds of uh, applications, thousands of instances, um, and the code's changing all the time. So we're particularly interested in uh, anything that helps with uh, continuous delivery. Um, so today, uh, this talk, I was going to talk about sort of the, these three use cases that we use Mesos for, um, our sort of new microservices platform using Docker, uh, sort of a Jenkins build farm, and other sort of Jenkins uh, workflows. Um, I'm, if there's time, I'm going to throw in a bunch of notes on setting up an HA setup and, and some details about uh, CentOS that we ran into, or CentOS shop. I know most people run this stuff on Ubuntu, so I uh, thought it might be interesting. And then questions. All right, so the first uh, use case for um, Mesos was uh, basically to be a Docker launcher for uh, a new platform. Uh, this is the use case you usually hear about. Um, you know, Docker apps running in, in Mesos, launched by Marathon, um, and Mesos basically just manages a, a big resource pool. Um, Marathon also allows for sort of a, a rolling uh, blue-green blue deploy. Um, so this is a, a simplified picture of our, our pipeline um, for the microservices platform that basically has the developer only interacting with our, our code repository. It's uh, Atlassian Stash, which is basically private Git, um, which triggers a, a, a build step, um, a deployment step, various tests, and so on, all the way to production, which have some additional sort of uh, paperwork steps. Uh, that's the service now piece in the bottom corner. Uh, and it talks to multiple clusters because we have both pre-production and production. They're network segmented, so we, we run multiple clusters. Um, zoomed in, the, uh, the, the, the deployment stuff kind of looks like this, right? Jenkins talks to Marathon, which talks to each of our slave nodes, which has a bunch of companion services. Um, but effectively, uh, Jenkins is running an Ansible playbook that talks to Marathon uh, to perform the launch. Um, it, uh, th so the playbook calls uh, Marathon through this, uh, this Python library. Um, if you've used Marathon, when you launch an application, it's asynchronous. It just sort of hands back a deployment ID. Uh, we sort of have to turn that into a, a synchronous call, otherwise the, the pipeline just sort of keeps going. Uh, and that's where that Python magic comes in. Um, the pseudocode looks something like this, pretty straightforward. You basically check Marathon to see if your application's running. If it's not, you launch the particular Docker application. If it is already running, you do a put instead of a post. Uh, you get a deployment ID back, and you basically just kind of check every once in a while up until some sort of timeout error or failure case. And uh, once you've done that, Marathon then goes to all the using the constraints kind of decides where, where to put everything, launches the particular container. In this case, we're performing an upgrade in this picture. Um, Marathon pulls the, uh, the configured uh, health endpoints, and if everything's OK, it basically tears down the old version, and you're running the new version. Um, and once you're done with this, we move on to the next environment, and so on until we're in production. Um, and sort of the, the icing on the cake with using Marathon is that should one of your uh, slaves decide to uh, tank, or just because you're moving things around, uh, you, you, you still have sort of marathon watching. It's, it's keeping an eye, and it'll basically find a new home for the app, relaunch it, check the health endpoint, and then you're back in full capacity. Um, so there's a, a lot more to sort of the microservices platform. Um, I gave a talk with uh, another Orbitz engineer, Rick, um, 
Uh, so I'm going to post these slides afterwards to, if you want to check out the details of this. Um, but this is kind of very specific to what's actually on each of the individual boxes, so I won't get into that today. But um, so this is sort of the first use case. This is Mesos, a place to launch Docker containers, Docker apps. Uh, the second use case is, uh, is sort of the build farm. Now, we do a lot of Jenkins deploys, or a lot of Jenkins builds. We have a, a, a dedicated farm for all this. And the setup is currently um, uh, much more complicated than it needs to be. Uh, all the slaves are sort of hand set up. When you install everything that you want on those machines, they snapshot them. They mirror it using VMware. They snapshot all this replicate it to all the other slaves, and then anytime somebody needs some new version of a library or whatever else, you have to go back and repeat the process. It's, it's very manual. It's also very hard to make you know, 20 versions of this, that, and the other thing all fit on the same kind of box. Um, and so we kind of wanted to get out of this, right? So in a typical deployment, uh, this is kind of what it looks like. You push your code. Uh, you either trigger uh, Jenkins directly or use the polling mechanism. It goes out to a slave, builds your code, right? Pushes up to your artifact. This is uh, in the corner. That's uh, Artifactory. That's our private, uh, like Maven and Docker repository. Um, and then when you're done, we run this crazy time machine script that sort of snaps the slave back into a, into a clean state. Um, over the years, a lot of the build uh, system sort of escape the sort of Jenkins uh, workspace environment. So after build, you kind of have this dirty slave, um, which kind of made it really hard to run multiple jobs on the same box because they'd be stomping on each other. It, it, it was just bad news. And so what we really wanted was something like what was described in this eBay blog post a couple years ago, where they basically said, hey, we are going to use Mesos to create ephemeral Jenkins slaves. Um, if you saw the, uh, the Puppet Labs uh, talk yesterday, um, there's a lot of this. Um, and so the picture now becomes something like this, where you push your code, and the master will now spin up the slave somewhere in your Mesos cluster. It calls back, checks in, and now the job executes just like before, except now when you're done, you can basically nuke that slave, and you sort of have a clean setup all over again. I can tell you how long I wanted to use that stupid flame animation. All right, <laughs> although the keynote beat me to it today. <laughs> all right, so <clears throat> what makes this possible is this uh, Jenkins Mesos plugin. Um, not to be confused with the, the Docker plugin, which basically you point it at a machine and it'll launch a ephemeral slave. Uh, this launch it uses uh, Mesos as a, as a proxy to sort of launch it on many machines. It's really easy to set up. Um, after you install the plugin, you, scroll, you go to the configuration, you scroll down to the bottom. Um, you still have this libmesos dependency that everybody keeps talking about, uh, which hopefully will go away once the uh, HTTP API is um, more mature. Uh, you point it at your Mesos master. In this case, we're using a Zookeeper URL because we're running multi-master. Uh, so you have to ask a Zookeeper who the master is. Um, and then I leave it running all the time because it's basically a dedicated cluster at this point. And then once you do this and you go to the Mesos console, you'll see this Jenkins scheduler has launched, right? So it's a pretty easy setup. For every slave type that you want, if you expand that bottom section in the configuration, uh, this is where you specify the parameters for each of your slaves, right? You start with a label string going from top to bottom here, how much RAM and CPU it needs. This particular job needs a lot of RAM. That's why, so we give it more. <clears throat> um, we give it some constraints. Uh, we set the, uh, the number of executors per slave to one because we basically want single-use slaves. And we set the timeout to be, the idle timeout to be relatively small. Now, it's, you don't want to set this too small because after the build phase, it turns out if the, if the slave exits uh, too quick and tears itself down, the job fails. So it needs to be long enough that the job will complete all the post-build steps, but not so long that it's just hanging around wasting resources. And then down at the bottom, you check that little use Docker, Docker containerization. You point it at the particular Docker image that you want to use as your Jenkins slave. And 
that's all you have to do for the setup. In your job configuration, you go to the place where you say restrict this job, you give it the same label name, and in our particular case, um, we added a little uh, feature for um, single use. This basically marks the slave offline as soon as the build kicks off, and that way it doesn't accidentally get um, assigned to another, another job. Um, once this is running, if you dig down into the, uh, the framework, you can, you can see a bunch of the, the Jenkins slaves running. Um, and if you look at this, it, at the uh, output of your Jenkins job, you'll see a few Dockerisms, such as you know, the IP of the slave is now like this, these weird 172 Docker space addresses, random slave names, uh, but you can see that tag there, right? So awesome, this works. Um, but then it kind of occurred to us as we were sort of focusing so much on building our, our Java applications and other things that uh, the slaves themselves were also sort of compiled things that we needed to build. And so we needed to basically build uh, these Docker images in Mesos. So I needed to be able to do Docker and Docker on Mesos. And it, it turns out this is actually possible. Um, and here's how you do it. <clears throat> so the requirements for a Docker-capable slave in Jenkins is, well, one, it has to be able to run Jenkins, which means it basically needs JRE or JDK. Uh, you have to launch it in supervisor mode. Uh, but in order to actually compile Docker within Docker, Docker has to be running. Well, if you, the way the, the plugin works is when it launches, the only process in there is, is the Jenkins slave. And so you need, um, there's a, a, a little wrapper script that you have to do, which will launch Docker and then run the Jenkins slave. And I'll show you that in a second. Um, finally, things like credentials for like pushing and pulling from your code repository or your artifact repository, be it Docker Hub or your private repository, you don't want to put those in your slave image because um, that's kind of sensitive. You throw all that in uh, Jenkins using the credentials binding plugin. Um, and then the last thing that we wanted to do ar around these Docker builders, and this is more optional, it's more of a time saving kind of thing, that when I'm building Docker, I have to pull down all these sort of dependent layers like I'm building off of a CentOS base. I don't want every slave to have to refetch that down. So uh, I reuse previously pulled images by sharing this varlib docker layer. Um, now the thing that makes it possible to run the docker within docker is this wrap docker script uh, from Jerome Piazzo, if you're out there, I'm sorry if I butchered your last name. Um, and effectively it sets up Doc, everything you need to do to run Docker from within Docker. Um, I had to make a small modification. I think this might be a CentOS 7-ism, but the, the variable substitution wasn't working, so I'm just noting it here if you guys run into that issue. Um, but to actually have a container now that, that runs uh, Docker and Jenkins, uh, my Docker file looks something like this. Um, on the left, I start with a CentOS 7 base because we're a CentOS shop, so um, that's what we're running on the physical box, so that's what we run uh, in here, we do things like uh, delete all the uh, public uh, yum repos and DNS and replace it with our own internal stuff. And then down there at the bottom, you see we install a JRE, we install Git, and the Docker engine. Um, on the right, had to do a couple extra things uh, because we're going to be pushing the Git, and these machines don't really have like an identity. Uh, it tries to figure it out, and it kind of errors out. So you kind of have to stub this. Uh, a git config for, um, for your Jenkins slave uh, when you're pushing tags and things like that. Uh, here you can see we're copying the wrap docker script I just mentioned and the volume that we're going to be mounting. So once you've built this, uh, of course you have to build by hand the first time until, the, until you have this set up. Uh, you go back into the plugin configuration and further down there's a lot of these sort of more advanced options. Uh, below the actual like image where you have to say, okay, I want you to run it in supervisor in privilege mode. Um, there's this checkbox for um, the use custom Docker command shell. That's that rip wrap script uh, that I mentioned. You just specify it there. And then down at the bottom there, you see I'm mounting the varlib Docker so that I can reuse the layers. Feels a little weird, like maybe that should cause some problems. We haven't seen any problems with it yet. Um, however, uh, because we're running, for instance, in this case, the particular machine that this is executing on is actually using the overlay 
um, storage uh, driver for Docker, this also has to do it, and that's what we're passing that, that bottom parameter for. So that's all sort of an administrative setup. From, from a user perspective, this is all you're really doing. You say, run it on this Docker builder, get my uh, credentials and bind it to this environment variable, and then down in the, uh, the execute section of the build, you basically just have to move that into like your docker.cfg, um, and then go through sort of your standard build, which is you know, build it, tag it, push it up to your repo. Um, in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm tagging it both as latest and, and a numerical version. Uh, and then, of course, you want to do some cleanup at the bottom because you're sharing the layers, which means once your slave is destroyed, if you didn't clean up those, those, those uh, Docker containers uh, that you just built on this machine, uh, eventually run out of disk space. So once you have that, you, you, can, you can start seeing some other use cases. So for instance, I had a, a, a simple Go program that I needed to compile, so I needed a Go compiler, and then I also wanted to package it as Docker. Um, so what I did was I built this, this Go builder slave, which derived from the Docker builder that I had just built, installed Go, and that was it, right? And now I have a Go builder, and you can, you can see you can kind of you know, keep repeating this, um, creating sort of special purpose slaves. This also allows for a lot, of, um, a lot more experimentation that we had before. So we could try different different versions of Java, different operating systems, all kinds of things that you, know, you, you, you were fighting with trying to make all these things coexist on your Jenkins slaves. Now you just sort of build all these special purpose slaves and, and everything's kind of nice. All right, so that's the, the Mesos as a build farm case, right? Um, now, very similar to this was uh, what we call the deployment farm. So we had a lot of sort of random jobs that we needed to run, uh, including I need to launch my stuff in uh, Marathon. And so we needed basically a way to hook that into the pipeline that we already had, and it seemed, well, why don't we just make a Jenkins slave that has everything I need to perform this? And so uh, that's where we came up with the idea for the Marathon deployer. Um, so the Marathon deployer, we're gonna use to talk to Marathon. So we do this because we're already using Ansible, we're making use of this Marathon Python library that, that's out there, uh, which basically abstracts all the API stuff away into sort of Python code um, that we were able to bake into our, our playbook. This is what I was talking about before with um, going from sort of, this creates the sort of synchronized uh, interaction with, uh, with Marathon. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, again, this is kind of the, the, the setup. It's, you'll notice a lot of the stuff is, is very similar. We clean up all the repos. We install, in this case, just Java and Git for interacting with, with uh, the source code repository. We don't install Docker this time because we're not building Docker. Um, set up all that stuff. And then on the right, we install some extra packages like the Boto library for Python, which is used to, or I'm sorry, not the Boto library, the uh, Ansible and um, some other things. Uh, now, in this particular case, the Docker file, whenever you see Docker files, they always uh, just sort of show them as this static thing. In, in this particular case, we had, a, a, we had this pip install that when we ran it in certain environments, uh, sometimes we needed to pass this with proxy parameter, because I guess pip doesn't automatically pick up the HTTPS proxy environment variable where we had to go through like a squid proxy. And so, depending on where this was built, uh, whether it was in our sort of production environment, which had more uh, stringent network uh, restrictions and you had to go through a proxy, or in a development environment where you didn't, this was conditional. And so effectively what we did was we, we kind of templatized our Docker file, and um, that was just sort of a simple Go templating, and we just modified the job a little bit to run it through, uh, right before we did the build, run it through this um, little template interpreter thing that we wrote called Amigo. It basically just binds environment variables to a file and then creates the file. In this case, it goes from dockerfile.tmpl to dockerfile. But you can use whatever templating thing you like. Um, and uh, so in that way, we have sort of an environment-specific Docker file. So, um, so what kind of, uh, uh, sort of another use case that kind of crosses the boundary between both the builder and the deployer case was uh, we had, we were doing some experiments with um, Amazon, and we wanted to kind of do it the the um, the uh, Netflix way, uh, 
where instead of sort of thin provisioning a machine and then running a bunch of Chef and things like that on it, we, we wanted to pre-bake these, these Amazon images, um, which uh, we were gonna use Packer. And so we said, well, we need a sort of Amazon-capable slave that can run all these sort of Amazon commands for um, either building using Packer or basically doing other Amazon operations like syncing files and things like that. And so we needed a Jenkins slave we, we referred to as the AWS monkey. Um, it needed to be obviously a Jenkins slave. It needed all the sort of things that we use with Amazon, like in this case, Packer and Ansible. Um, uh, we basically use An uh, Ansible here to parameterize the Packer build. Um, and uh, of course the Amazon command line. And then of course, because you need Amazon credentials, you don't want to bake those into the slave, so you use the credentials binding there. The Docker file, a lot of this should look familiar at this point. Same setup on the left. Now you can say, well, why don't you make a, you know, a common layer for you know, the stuff on the left? I could have, but I, I didn't want to sort of make everybody use CentOS 7. I wanted everybody to kind of pick what they wanted. Um, but anyway, on the right, kind of see the, the, me installing all the sort of utilities that I need, things like Ansible and um, Packer, um, the Python Boto library, which is a nice um, uh, Amazon Python library that goes nicely with, with uh, doing Ansible. Um, uh, you can see the curl there that's doing like installing the latest uh, Amazon command line. And then I have to set some extra environment variables at the bottom to make sure some of the Unicode transfers work properly. Um, and like before, this is kind of the same as we saw before. Uh, you give it a tag, you give it how many executors. Uh, you constrain it to which uh, um, meso service it can use by um, tag here. I've got it tagged as uh, using the service cluster mark general. Um, and then this is all pretty much the same. Um, in the job configuration, I pass the credentials this way. This is sort of a common way to work with Amazon. If these two environment variables are set in your job context, then the command line just sort of does the right thing. So in this case, I use this username password mapping to environment field. Works out very nice. Um, so coming back to the pipeline, you know, whatever yours looks like, whatever tool you're using, right, start with the steps, you break it down, and then make as many slaves as you need to kind of, um, you know, get, get working what you need working. Uh, if you can't make it work, in a Docker slave, then just make a regular Jenkins slave, right? Uh, we, we did that before we actually got the Docker and Docker stuff working. Um, but the idea here is to try and make it as sort of hands-off as possible, where you check in your code and your deployment to production is as streamlined as possible. Um, okay, so this is Mesos as the deployer farm. All right, so um, last year, Mesosphere handed out these really nice USB keys that had sort of a you know, turnkey, you know, run the script, boom, you've got a Mesos cluster, right? And this is a great way to start. They also have a lot of great online documentation, but when you get past that, the documentation got really hard to find on how to sort of set up multi-master and, and, and get it just set up right with the Docker stuff. Um, it may be better now, but I, I, I just wanted to sort of assemble all the stuff I pulled together uh, just so it's all in one place if you want to reference it. Um, and I uh, also want to point out, you want to, so you want to make sure you're running multiple masters so that you know, it's, it's production-like, uh, even in your pre-production environments. Um, and it's also okay to run multiple Mesos clusters. I know that sort of goes against the party line, but um, you know, if it makes sense to sort of split them up, uh, for instance, ours uh, production is network firewalled from pre-production, so it makes sense to have two rather than try and poke firewall holes all over the place. All right, so the, it turns out that the, the, the multi-master setup and the multi-marathon um, uh, and and, and setups is actually quite, uh, it fits nicely together. You wanna make sure that you're running an odd number. Um, we run three, we haven't seen the need to run five. You want an odd number, this is for uh, leader election. Um, and uh, we, so we co-located Zookeeper, the Mesos Master, uh, Marathon, and Kronos, and then we added in uh, Apache Web Server here to basically do the authentication. So our setup looks something like this. We have an internal load balancer, which basically maps to sort of three well-known servers. Um, 
We terminate SSL on the load balancers because we do that for a lot of stuff, so it just seemed easier to do it that way. Um, we do all the authentication through AD or LDAP. In our case, we use AD. You have to be a member of a certain group. This is how you keep people from going to the production marathon and clicking delete, right? Um, so the Zookeeper setup, this is pretty straightforward, so it's kind of basic if you've seen this, but um, for your Zookeeper setup, you basically list all your Zookeeper uh, slaves, server one, two, three. You have to, on each individual one, you have to have this my ID file, which basically says, I'm number one in that list, I'm number two in that list. And then once you've got it all running, you wanna make sure that you have one leader <laughs> and the rest are all followers. Nothing else will work if this is not set up right, okay? Now on the master, to set up the multi-master, um, what you wanna do is you want to take that zookeeper string that we keep seeing for Mesos and put it in this uh, ZK file. These, this is using the Mesosphere RPMs. These files wind up getting mapped to command line parameters, so the ZK file is dash dash ZK equals the contents and so on. You wanna make sure you set up the host name and the IP. That's because the USB key has all this stuff set to localhost and they can't communicate with each other when everybody thinks that they're all 127001. So you have to set that up. So, I, I wish that was just more automatic, but you have to do that. Um, turns out all those uh, sort of offers and, and rejection messages uh, are logged at info level. It's gonna fill up your, uh, your disk pretty fast. Um, so we kind of turn that down by overriding the logging level. Uh, and then of course you have to set the quorum so that the masters know, you know how many are out there so that it can wait to see the quorum before it starts running and, and making decisions. Uh, this is how you can sort of set it up by hand. Please don't set this up by hand. Use Chef, use Puppet, use your favorite configuration tool. Don't do this by hand. Um, and just for completeness, this is uh, how you set up the slave to sort of be Docker capable. A lot of the same stuff at the top with the zookeeper string, the host name, the IP. Um, you need to uh, override the executor registration timeout to be longer. This is to allow Docker time to pull down the Docker images from Docker Hub or your local repository. You also wanna set this Docker stop timeout. This defaults to zero, which means when your Jenkins slave is done or whatever, your, whatever application you're running in Docker, when, it decide, when you tell Marathon to shut it down, it'll just kill it. And so if you're registered with like console or something like that, you wind up with these sort of, uh, it, it doesn't have enough time to clean up. So you wanna set this to a larger number to give the application time after it's signaled to shut down and do some cleanup, close up your database connections, whatever you're doing. Um, and then obviously you have to override the containerizer uh, parameter. Um, and then lastly, these, uh, these attributes, this is, uh, is, is kind of how you tag the slaves so that you can constrain them. Um, we kind of kept it fairly simple uh, since we provision most of our stuff with Chef. We always tag it with the Chef environment that it's in. Um, and again, we use Chef to provision this. Um, and uh, it just group the boxes based on whatever you want to group them on. If you want to do it based on purpose, like here we're using you know, Jenkins versus whatever, uh, if you want to tag it based on, you know, these have fast disks or these have high CPU or whatever, you know, dice and slice it however, however you, um, you want to. Uh, so anyway, hopefully that'll, that'll help get some of you rolling past the uh, sort of simple setup. Um, and then a, a couple notes on the, on the CentOS side and, and um, that I wanted to mention. So one of the things that we noticed when we were running these sort of Jenkins slaves as Docker containers was that we would randomly see a Jenkins slave just disconnect. It'd be running for 40 minutes, it'd be a really, really long job. And you don't want that thing running for 40 minutes and then just dying. And so we spent some time looking into it and it turns out, and I, I don't know if this is just a CentOSM, according to this article that we found, this is, um, this is a Linuxism where, so when you start up the Docker engine on your slave, um, it sets up this Docker zero bridge and that's what provides that networking abstraction layer. Well. It winds up taking on the, uh, uh, apparently when you have a bridge interface, it takes on the MAC address of the lowest like numerical MAC address of whatever's attached to it. And so if you launch it in the default way, it just randomly picks one. When you launch the container, it takes over that one, and then if 
and then that job could be running for a while, another one gets launched, and if it has a lower number, it basically remaps the MAC address, and all the connections reset, and your slaves just go poof. Um, so there's a simple way around this. You basically just set up the bridge interface yourself for Docker, and when you launch Docker, um, pass, pass the, the name of the bridge using the bridge parameter. Um, this, was, this was a tough one to find, so hopefully this is useful. And uh, for our setup, you know, there's a lot of questions around like, you know, what mix of storage driver do you use and, and things like that with Docker. Um, because Jenkins produced so much uh, I.O. to the disk, the default like device mapper, the loopback device mapper that you just get by default was basically freezing the machine a lot. Um, so the combination, sort of the magic combination that works for us, your mileage may vary, is we basically run uh, CentOS 7.1. We upgraded the kernel in order to get the overlay uh, file system support. And we run Docker with the overlay file system storage driver on an ext4 separate partition for varlib docker. Um, there's an interesting bug that when you're doing these Docker builds and you're doing like yum install this, yum install that, you'll get like a weird like RPM corruption problem. It's, it's going to be fixed in 7.2, but uh, there's a workaround in this bug report. Um, Okay, so to summarize, uh, so we have uh, found that using Jen this combination of, of Jenkins and Mesos and Marathon is, is, is really, really powerful. It's, it's really enabled a lot more uh, self-service, um, much more DevOps. Uh, it's very clear what people are delivering now because everything's Dockerized and operations basically just deals with things like capacity and making sure Mesos and all the supporting services are running. Um, the Jenkins plugin supports both um, multiple Jenkins masters connecting to it. Uh, so our pre, uh, I just looked one day, and in our pre-production clusters, all those random uh, Jenkins boxes that people have under their desks, they were tapping into the pre-production Mesos cluster and using it as a big resource pool. Okay, it's pre-production, go for it. Um, if it makes them faster, right, that's, that's good for everybody. Um, the plugin also supports uh, hooking into multiple Mesos clusters. So uh, we have two data centers, two production environments, uh, and so our production cluster, our production Jenkins, actually plugs into both because if I can't run into one data center because there's a network problem or whatever, I can run it in the other one. Uh, so that's totally okay. Um, it, as you've seen, it obviously works with Red Hat. It's not just for Ubuntu. Um, again, make your, your, your cluster separate if it, if it makes sense for some you know, reason, uh, production, non-production, security, whatever. Um, and then uh, don't be afraid to uh, run your slaves as VMs. This, this is especially handy in, in pre-production environments where somebody wants to you know, go test an upgrade to the new Mesos or you know, test something. You want to carve off just a tiny little bit of resource for them. Uh, it, it, it's okay if you're if you're uh, you know running in in the public cloud. You're getting VMs anyway, uh, so VMs and, and Mesos uh, slaves aren't a bad thing. Um, so you know, finally, the, le the sort of the lesson learned as we kind of went through this whole experiment was, you know, for so long we tried to sort of make everybody do things the same way, and we spent too much time focusing on oh everybody used the same Java and everybody used the same operating system and things like that. And what we really need to do was take it up a level so that we had a more consistent sort of process that everybody followed. And then what you ran inside of your little Dockerized world, that's, you know, that's your problem. If you want to run some crazy thing and it breaks you're, and you're okay with like troubleshooting it, go for it, right? We don't want to be in your way. What we want to do is enable you to you know, get your code from your laptop to production as fast as possible. Um, because no matter how much you try to sort of align everything, um, you know, Orbis is a pretty old company. We've, we've, everything has basically been in a state of transition for years. You're, you're never really done. It's always changing. Somebody's always trying something new. So rather than fighting that, um, you know, come up with a way to just sort of uh, enable it, right? And, and everybody will be much happier. Um, and with that, it looks like we got five minutes for questions. If any. Anyway, I'll, I'll post the slides. I know, I know there's a lot of detail um, that you can take away. Uh, 
I'll, uh, I'll post a link on Twitter. You had a question? Uh, the question was, are we using stateful containers? Um, so right now, all, um, most of the applications that we're running here are, have the state offloaded to either databases or you know, Couchbase or, or whatever. Um, there's a lot that's been going on this year, especially around uh, Docker 1.8 with the, with the um, pluggable storage. Uh, so that, will, that may change. Um, one of the first things that will, that will be stateful that will probably move into uh, Mesos will probably be um, the Jenkins master itself. Um, I know the, the team that runs our master uh, would very much like to put it in Mesos just so that if it dies wherever it's running, it'll just kind of jump to another box and start up there. Um, there's obviously some uh, things you, you, can, you can do using old school technology like um, we, you can mount a uh, NS, NFS volume on all of them and just make sure that there's only one instance running and it can basically just hop around and if the volume's there, you mount the volume in just like we did varlib docker. Um, and that's a way to sort of cheat until things get a little more mature in the uh, pluggable space. Um, there's also a post, post yesterday from the Rancher guys. I think they, um, something called Convoy. Uh, looks kind of interesting. We're gonna check that out too. Anybody else? Yeah. I'm sorry, can you say it louder? Oh, uh, what are we doing to route uh, web traffic to new versions? So, um, and uh, this is, a lot of this is covered in that, in that talk that I mentioned. Uh, what we basically use is, um, for the most part, service to service communication, we go through our service discovery mechanism, which is a console. Um, but for things that don't, that aren't console aware, like your web browser, um, we run through a uh, HA proxy farm using uh, something called uh, Bamboo, not the Atlassian Bamboo, it's um, uh, from the Qubits guys. Uh, they're here somewhere. And uh, I met the guy last night, very nice. Um, that's also in the talk. Effectively what we do when we launch it in Marathon is we add a couple extra environment variables that are hints so that when Bamboo sees the application's launch, um, it reruns the HA proxy template, so you have a farm of, of, of bamboo boxes behind a load balancer, and that acts as sort of your routing to your, uh, your specific instances. Um, and then as you add new ones, the old ones roll out, and HA proxy just updates. Okay, the question is, are the bamboo boxes running inside or outside the Mesos cluster? Right now, they're running outside the Mesos cluster because we need them at sort of a known address. Now, we could have simply said, you know, run it on every Mesos slave, right? But we, we kind of wanted to scale um, that layer independent of the compute, you know, the, the rest of the service. Because over time, we see the number of things coming in through the front door and the number of, ser are, is going to be relatively small compared to the number of things that are going to be running in, in total that are all sort of chatting each other through the console uh, discovery. Um, so right now we have those separate, uh, or, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested in uh, hearing about the dev bot parity. Uh, your, your, your developers, how are they creating environments on their laptop? How does that differ from, say, a, a dev environment and then finally a prod? How are they setting up their system? Okay, so the question is, uh, thoughts on dev versus prod parity? Um, do you mean from a sort of Mesos point of view, or? Okay, so are the developers using Docker on their laptops? Uh, there, there are definitely developers who are are playing with uh, sort of a Docker uh, on the laptop kind of thing. A lot of our applic it, it really depends on the application. We have a lot of old applications that are just so big that you just can't even run them on a laptop because they have you know like 48 gig heaps or something like that, and your you know MacBook's not going to have that. So, um, but, for, um, but for some of the uh, sort of microservices work, uh, they do run it, a, a lot of it locally. Um, most of the sort of companion services that go with it, like service discovery and whatnot, they, they'll run those locally as Docker, or a lot of times the code will just have some sort of fallback that, you know, if, the if there's no logging relay service, for instance, 
Um, it just outputs the console, your, the uh, standard out. Um, so we do a lot of that kind of stuff, um, but it's still kind of in the early stages. Um, you know, what we've been trying to do is, is get people to um, kind of make use of this Jenkins pipeline. Obviously for sort of development, you want it to be local, but when they're kind of done, we want to make sure that they sort of run it through run it through the ringer, through the sort of standard process and all the sort of tests get run so that, that um, it's more continuous, right? You make a tiny little change, you push it to production. You make a tiny little change, you push it to production. You don't want to get at the point where we were, you know, 10 years ago where we were doing like four releases a year and they were gigantic and they almost never went well and, you know, it would take a week to release the new code because like the change that was so huge, you had no idea what broke what. So. All right, uh, looks like we're out of time, so if you guys have any more questions, just grab me, and uh, thanks.